everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, freelance writer at Billboard, Variety, Hollywood Reporter, Goldmine, Access, and wherever else I can get my uh, stuff printed. Welcoming you to another edition of Things We Said Today, our weekly talk fest about the Beatles' past, present, and to come. Let me first introduce my two cohorts in crime up in the state of Maine, where I assume it's it's white uh, uh, because of the snow on the ground. Um, our musicologist and uh, man who knows all about classical music and any kind of music, the great uh, former uh, editor of the Beatles desk at the New York Times, Mr. Alan Cosen. Hello, Alan. Hey, Steve. Hello, everyone. Alan is the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and got that something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, to get in the plug. Um, in the state of Connecticut, the host of the Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hey, Steve. Hi, everybody. And we have some interesting guests this week. I'm going to do a little, do it a little differently and introduce them early on, because uh, you guys are welcome to chime in anytime. Uh, first, the former publisher of Good Day Sunshine and the and a current festival and tour producer you all know and an all-around good guy. I, I mean, I don't even have to introduce him, but I will. The great Charles Rosenay. Hello, Charles. Wow. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> Appreciate the intro. And we have a very, very special... This is a reunion, guys. We welcome back to Things We Said Today. Just for today, unfortunately, the f- executive editor, editor of Beetle Fan, the friend of the Fest for Beetle Fans, and the, uh, an alumnus for, of, of Things We Said Today, <sighs> Mr. Al Sussman. Welcome back, Al. Gentlemen, how are you? Yay! Hi, Al. We're, we're, I'm applauding both of you guys. They um, dragged me back in. They yeah. we dragged you back in. Drag you back. Yes. Uh, just when you thought you uh, were going to get away, we drag as Al as Al Pacino said in, in Godfather Three. Anyway, um, we're going to run through a couple of quick bites of news, real quick, and then we'll get around to what we're going to talk about today, which is we're going to talk about Beetle fan magazines. And so we'll we'll discuss that in a minute. There is a couple of pieces of news. I, I, let me start with the uh, sad news of the passing of uh, photographer Paul Goresh, who uh, passed away on January 9th. I don't think I have to say too much to anybody listening about who he is. He is the guy that was at the Dakota the night John was killed and took pictures of John and the killer um, – John signing the guy's uh, album, and and he also took some of the last uh, other last photographs of John, and he passed away. Uh, um, uh, I believe he had uh, a heart ailment, uh, and that's uh, and he succumbed to that. Uh, our condolences to his family. There was also some news about uh, the the death of uh, Tom Petty that the coroner said it was an accidental overdose, and I know there was a lot of discussion about that and. But uh, given you know, uh, given the fact that he must have been taking a lot of uh, uh, medications for his, uh, I get apparently he was in a lot of pain, um, and that's um, it was really sad to hear about that. Uh, really sad. Uh, any anybody want to comment on either of those two? Maybe just to say that Paul Goresh, um, you know, got to be friendly with John and Yoko. Uh, you know, towards the end of John's life and that they, I believe used some of his photos as covers for singles. Yeah. Watching the wheels. Right. Supposed Mm -hmm. to be his photo. Yeah. Yeah. Charles, you said you knew him. Uh, I knew him from uh, meeting at at events and also Facebook friends. And, you know, he's a true fan, you know, he kept in touch with everybody and, you know, had no, no kind of ego that, you know, he was a photographer or had anything, you know, special, just, just loved the Beatles and loved John. Mm-hmm. Al, did you know him? Uh, only as a uh, a Facebook friend, and really had no no contact with him at all. No. Did he appear at at uh, some of your events, uh, Charles? No, uh, he, I think he came to some of my events, you know, as a fan, but no, never as a guest, never as a speaker or as an exhibitor or anything like that. No. Okay. Okay. There's uh, also some 
possibles, uh, I guess we'll put it, put it that way. Um, the first, uh, <laughs> while we were gone, uh, uh, while we were out last week, um, the news, uh, I, I wrote a story about the, about Yellow Submarine um, coming back one night uh, on the big screen in the UK, and people have asked if uh, it's going to happen in the US. And at the time I wrote the story, there was no indication, but I'm, I'm hearing that there is a possibility that it will happen here now. But uh, it, nothing has been announced, and that's just a, a, a possible, you know, question mark. So don't take that as a as a definite. Um, the other thing they're saying, is, they're saying in the UK it's for one day. Well, and yeah, I, one, I certainly hope that it's more than that and more than that here. Do any I, of us do any of us have a pipeline to Apple? It should be released in the theaters as a sing along version, the same way they release uh, like Sound of Music or Grease mm-hmm. with the lyrics. Yeah. And people could sing in the audience. That's what needs to be done. The UK release didn't say anything like that, Charles. It just said no. they were doing the movie. Right. So I, 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 I don't know that that's possible. I will look into that, however, with my contacts. But as far as I know, it's just the it's just the regular movie. The other thing is there, uh, and this is all. Again, very much speculation. There are rumors that Paul will be touring in the UK. So again, that has not been announced. Their speculation is based on the fact that you know everybody knows that the album is coming, and he hasn't toured there for a while. So it's about four years, right? So I mean, it makes sense, but we don't know anything for sure. And I don't want to put any hopes for anyone in listening into the in the UK that this is definite. It's not. It's just there is a, 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 a website that posted a, a rumor to that effect, and I won't say it's not a fan site. This was something else. So who knows? We will see. So anyway, now we are going to get on to – oh, and then yet one other thing is the – uh, announcement of the concert for George reissue on the 23rd. They're doing a bunch of packages, including a very expensive, I believe it's $350 package, and that's going to have, you know, all sorts of stuff: uh, Blu-rays, DVDs, books, etc., etc., etc. And I guess they're going. They're, they are doing smaller packages. It's about time this thing got reissued. I was surprised to find out that. The Blu-ray was out of print because I had I had picked one up a couple of years ago just off the top and uh, I was like surprised. So it's I'm glad they're bringing it. They, I mean, this thing should not be going out of print. So anyway. it's also being released on vinyl, right? For the first time, and it's it's, it's four time. it's it's four discs, right? The concert for George. So um, and the box set is ten discs because it's supposed to be four, you know, vinyl copies plus two CDs, uh, two CD and DVD, two CD and Blu-ray, and I think that's it. So that's the, the, blue, the, the Blu-ray set is, is two discs. So because of the, you know, the theatrical version and the, the uh, version is shot. So, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, one more thing I'll mention that we got a bunch of great responses on the Wally Pedrasic show two weeks ago. Thank you for all, for all of those. Uh, a couple of people said they had not heard about the books and, and learned about them from our from the podcast, and that's fantastic. I'm glad to hear that, and I'm glad we put out a uh, you know a new you know uh, I, a lot of people got refamiliar with the, with the books uh, in that case. I know I spent a lot of time looking at them, uh, you know, both before and after the broadcast again, and they are marvelous. Wally, thank you again for, for being with us. But today we're going to talk about publication of a different kind. We're going to talk about Beatle fan magazines, and we're going to have two of the people that were involved with two of the – well, I, I should say the two most, pro- most important Beatle fan scenes, I think, that – there has been and one is Al Sussman who is currently the executive editor of Beatle Fan and uh, I want to say Bill King if you're listening and I know you are we miss you we wish you were here Uh, I'm um, I'm, I'm basically pinch hitting for you're uh, pinch pinch hitting for uh, for for Bill King who's the the publisher uh, of Beatle Fan and who you know founded it uh, right uh, very close to 40 years ago we're we're in our 40th year now wow 
And also with us is Charles Rosene, who who also was the founder and first publisher of Good Day Sunshine. How many years ago, Charles? We start, yeah, we started in 81, but we would be remiss if we don't mention um, the, the, the founder and the pioneer and the predecessor, uh, Joe Pope, who used to publish Absolutely. Good Day Sunshine. Right. It was yeah. uh, who published Strawberry Fields Forever, and that was that was the best ever in history, the funniest, um, it, it, groundbreaking, and it was everything that you know every fanzine wants it to be. Mm-hmm. No question. So anyway, um, so we're going to do a little roundtable here with with um, these guys, and we're going to talk about the history of the of the fanzines and how how they worked and how it was to publish them, and I mean. Let me start with uh, each of you. I mean, uh, uh, Charles and, and Al, what led up to the starting of both of the, of the magazines? And, uh, and uh, Charles, I'm going to start with you if you don't if, if you don't mind. Sure. So when when I started the fanzine, there was no internet, obviously, and the idea was how do I keep in touch with all these people who not only are coming to my Beatle conventions because I was doing conventions in '78 but also um, would love to come to the conventions, but are in, you know, areas beyond where I'm having the conventions. And I thought the best way to network that was through a a, a fan magazine, which I would uh, open up the first page with all the events that I was personally doing. It was sort of my personal letter to all these people who were writing in, and rather than write 600 letters a week, I thought, well, let me get it out in a a fanzine. Uh, At the time, Strawberry Fields was kind of in, in hiatus. It was disappearing from the scene. Beetle Fan had started, and Beetle Fan was the encyclopedia. It was the literal. It was the one that you went to for info, info, info. Strawberry Fields was the funny one and the one that had all the quips, and, you know, it was, it was in, in, also information and articles, but in, in a way also the mad magazine of, of Beetle mm-hmm. Fan scenes. Yeah. And I, th- I tried to be something in between that gave a lot of information, had a lot of articles, I had a lot of like in-person photos, and uh, also ha- retained some of the humor and per- my own personality in the magazine. And at the time, most of the magazines, aside from Beetle Fan and 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 Good Day Sunshine, were um, Xerox, you know, homemade. Send me, you know, five stamps, and we'll send you the next five issue kind of magazines, three mm-hmm. pages, four pages, and you know, GDS, Good Day Sunshine, and Beetle Fan were the first that were really. Uh, I'd like to think more professional uh, prosines as opposed to fanzines. Do you remember exactly. how many pages the first one was, Charles? Well, the first one was a newspaper. We were all set to go to print, and then, you know, a big tragedy happened, and, you know, we lost John. Mm-hmm. So the first issue sadly became a tribute edition, and it was a newspaper that you opened up a la Rolling Stone at the time. But thereafter, mm-hmm. it became, you know, the 8 by um, eight by ten or eight by eleven that it was it was um professionally offset and then eventually it became a color cover and, and a finer quality uh, magazine and ironically in its last days it was taken over by uh, Matt Hurwitz who really brought it to another level but at, at over a hundred 120 pages it became a book you can't put out a book every other month <laughs> and it's just it's too overwhelming I mean you know, people would say, hey, the Beatles aren't around. How, how do you have enough material to fill a magazine? And I said, I have too much. I, I don't have enough pages to put in all the stuff that there is. Right. So, yeah, that's a little bit of, you know, where we where we went with that. Al, what, what, how about you? Well, as, as Charles was saying, in the 70s, there had been Beatles fanzines. There were things like uh, Barb Fenix, the, uh, the Right Thing. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. There was the uh, the McCartney uh, the McCartney Observer, Observer uh, the Harrison Alliance, uh, and they were uh, for the most part they were they were as Charles was saying they were you know mimeographed and photos were you know copy pasted or actually literally pasted uh, back in those days. Now uh, Bill King is a uh, is a professional uh, is a professional journalist. Right. He, uh, he, he just like he just recently retired uh, from uh, 42 years with the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Right. And back in the 70s, he was he was the music and TV uh, beat reporter and rock critic. Was, was he really? Well, I didn't know. See, I didn't know that. 
Yeah. Because that that's yeah. kind of, that, that's uh, I mean I, I I mean I did a I was the the TV guy at the paper I worked at. I didn't know that uh, that Bill was doing that. I thought the, he was oh, on, yeah. I thought he was on the copy desk. That's what he told me. For the oh, Atlanta, that was late, right? That was later on. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but the, back in the seventies, he was you know he was on the both the TV and music. Mm-hmm. Uh, beat and and he had been collecting all these little bits, bits of news because of course in those in those days that was you know that was a very different time you know all four Beatles were still alive there was still the uh, the possibility of a reunion plus they were they were uh, having great success uh, with uh, with you know both singles and albums and tours and all. So, uh, so there was, you know, there was a lot of information out there, and Bill decided that uh, uh, that there should be a, you know, a more professionally done, uh, more professionally presented form mm-hmm. for um, of a Beatles publication, and uh, and as a matter of fact, he uh, uh, he he talked about this with, in fact, Mark and Carol Lapidus. Uh, just prior to the um, Atlanta Beetle Fest in the fall of 1978, and uh, Mark and Carol convinced them that that uh, there there was definitely a place for such a publication, and uh, uh, and so the first uh, the first issue of, of Beetle Fan was uh, basically went uh, uh, went to press at the uh, the end of uh, the end of 1978. Hmm. Did did Bill? Um, I mean, I, I I know that when I was working at the newspaper, because I had all that, you know, that, those news sources. I mean, I was watching for Beatles stuff coming through the wires. Was was Bill doing sure. the same thing? Was oh, Bill yeah, doing absolutely? Sure. Yeah, and because. and that was one that was one of the nice things about working at the paper. You you had all. I mean, this was before the internet, and you had all this stuff. You know that was coming to you. Things like you know you'd know about TV programs before anybody else. You knew about you know all sorts of things, and but sure. B- Bill was doing the same thing. Oh, absolutely! In fact, the uh, the early issues of Beetle Fan, the majority of the material in those first uh, two or three issues was news. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, and they were in fact they were um, they were put in hardbound by. Uh, was it Pierre and Press? By, by Pierre. It's funny because you uh, on the show with uh, with Wally, you were uh, were talking about Pierre and Press, and as it later became popular, Culture Inc. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it uh, uh, the first four years of, Is that what it was? Uh, of Beetle Fan are uh, are available in Wall well, Avail. I don't know if they're available. Uh, they're they've been out of print, of course, for many years. You might be able to find them on eBay. But they at least the two, you know, the first four years are there on in bound volumes. Yeah, I have those. Uh, I remember buying them way back when. I think I bought them when they came out. Uh, so they weren't, mm-hmm. you know. But now I think the the prices would be a little higher. But, but the oh, difference, oh, yeah. the difference in the issues between those beginning years and later, is like amazing. I mean, because yeah, you can see, you know, a Beetle fan just really came. It just grew and grew and grew and 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 you know, it developed well, and, well, and go well, ahead. Charles Car- Charles can address this because, uh, in fact, the first you know year or two, basically, uh, Bill and Leslie were putting the uh, the magazine together on their kitchen table <laughs> and basically doing paste up of <laughs> the uh, of the in- the entire magazine. You know, it's not like now where they do it on a computer. And I'm sure Charles had the same experience, right? Yeah, no computer at all. Uh, I would get in an article. I would type it up. I would position a photo. I'd lay out the pages. It took two months to put out an issue. And then yeah, we, we, it would take uh, another, whatever, week to, to mail it out. It was my parents, myself, and whatever friends I could talk into coming over and doing it and and literally thousands of issues were being poured out out of out of my kitchen you're exactly right and then we took uh, two days off and it was back to the issue again it was really uh, unbelievable the hardest and most time consuming and exhaustive thing i'd ever done we loved you know you were mentioning getting news sources about tv programs and all that 
I uh-huh. love getting um, media stuff because I cheated. I printed the exact capital press release that I would get. <laughs> I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't rewrite it. I wouldn't put it into an article. I would print it exactly how we received it with, you know, with all the information. So that was a plus because people were seeing things that only, you know, uh, Alan Cozen and only, you know, editors at newspapers were getting and they yeah. were changing it into articles. I was just printing them as is, you know, so that, <laughs> for me, it would take up two, three, four pages, but was also giving the readers, wow, this is direct from the horse's mouth kind of thing. Exactly. And those press releases today, some of them are, are, are like uh, history. I mean, they, they really are, you know. Um, uh, Alan, uh, Alan, let me go to you. Uh, you take over. Yeah. Um, when Bill started, I mean, it really was I mean, a, a completely different kind of magazine than it is today. And um, but, but I think, they, by the way, we probably, we probably should add that Alan has been part of the Beatle fan family for, uh, when was your first piece in, in the magazine? Uh, it was the early 80s. Okay. You know, I subscribed so to it, and, and I was reading it, and it's only completely by accident that I started writing for it. Actually, it was because I was a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> um, not usually the best, you know, job recommendation, but, you know, I had written Bill a letter. <laughs> I'd written Bill a letter that is, you know, now really sort of embarrassing. But for some reason, I just had gotten annoyed by, you know, the density of the layout, you know, and a number of other things. Maybe there were some articles that I thought might, you know, could have been better researched or whatever. So mm-hmm. I wrote Bill a letter just sort of saying a lot of this stuff, including that really the only thing I remember, because it was so stupid, was I complained that there wasn't enough white space that, you know, because they were putting it together the way they were, it was like the copy, right. the text was end to end. And yeah. Bill wrote back um, a, a suitably sort of angry response, pointing out that most of the readers mm-hmm. didn't really want to read white space. <laughs> and, you know, he had a point. And he, but, but also the thing is, I think he began by saying, you know, you clearly don't understand the realities of fanzine publishing. And he was right. I didn't understand the realities of fanzine publishing. And I knew, I knew that I wasn't subscribing to Time magazine. But, um, you know, I, I guess I hadn't really taken into account the difficulties that, you know, Bill and Charles and Barb Fennick and everybody who was doing them in those days were, mm-hmm. you know, were, were facing. And I felt actually so bad about my initial letter that fairly soon after that, I think the first Beatles CDs turned up, which were the Black Triangle, as it's now called, Japanese Abbey Road, and there was a a Japanese tug of war. And so I thought, okay, I'll review those for Bill. (laughs) So I sent them to Bill, and he printed them, and then I just kept sending stuff. And and then when I interviewed one of them or someone in their circle for the Times, I would typically send Bill a QA of the whole interview. So uh, in a way, Beatle fan was getting better stuff than my own paper was because they weren't <laughs> interested in the whole interview. They were interested in a, you know, a thousand word piece with some quotes in it. But so, you know, it got to the point where when I was when I was going to do these interviews, I was thinking of both of the places I was writing for, different as they were. Um and sure. you know, and keeping Bill in mind and, and what a Beatle fan reader might want to, you know, hear these guys say. So yeah, I I'm just sort of curious about, you know, both of your memories of um you know, apart from getting the press releases and, and printing the press releases as they were, which is actually kind of an interesting thing to do. And, and I know that fanzine readers, you know, loved seeing that kind of stuff. Like, how else did you get people to contribute? So uh, for, for me, um, Alan, I, I had the, uh, the great advantage of having a lot of friends who were attending my conventions. And, you know, in the early days, it was the Tom Frangione's uh, David Schwartz, a lot of really good guys who um, wanted it. They wanted to be print. You know, they wanted to see their name in print, and they were great writers. Bill Last, 
Ken also and Joanne, um, my mm-hmm. street, a lot of people, you know, who, who we all know the names. And um, it was a, an opportunity for them to see their name in print, get great articles out there. And I would pretty much pr- anything that came in, if it was half decent, I would print it. You know, uh, the, the pleasure of it was when I finally got to meet McCartney um, for a longer time. I, I gave him um, a, a bunch of issues of Good Day Sunshine. I gave him a copy of a book that David Schwartz wrote, you know, some of my editors. And he, he signed autographs to all of them. And that was my, you know, payoff after all those years of them contributing and not getting paid, obviously. Good Day Sunshine was never a money maker. It never had enough ads and never had enough, you know, even when it had 5,000 subscribers, uh, the cost of printing never, was always more than it was worth. But I always justified because I was producing the conventions and because in 83 I was starting doing the tours. So I saw it as a, a big picture. It was my uh, the Beatle network, the Beatle business. And, uh, you know, if Good Day Sunshine was a, a loser, but it was contributing to the tours, it made sense. I mean, and it's, you know, now the tours get 20, 30, 40 people. When GDS was at its peak, it was getting over 100 people. So it made sense for me to do it, even though, again, the longest hours, the most ridiculous amount of work. I, I can't imagine what I could have done with all that time. But when you got that final issue in your hand and the cover looked great mm-hmm. and the articles, you know, and you got the smell of that print, it was all worth it. Mm-hmm. Charles, didn't Linda say to you that, that uh, we read Good Day Sunshine all the time? Yeah, um, Linda, she was always amazing. You know, she would always say, oh, Connecticut, I'm Scarsdale, I remember you. She said, uh, she said, yeah, we get that all the time, and, I'm, and Paul and I look it over to see if things are right in it and all that. Um, <laughs> that, that was always nice. Uh, when we had our 10th anniversary, because uh, Joe Pope used to put out flexi-discs, I put out cassettes, and every year yeah. we did a cassette, but for our 10th anniversary we did a CD, if I'm not mistaken, and mm-hmm. Paul and all the members of his band, and Alan, I mean, uh, down the line, Alan Williams, Tony Sheridan, Richie Havens, those people all contributed congratulatory messages. So that was, you know, that was, uh, you know, I, I've already, I'm established. When Paul, you know, sends a message and says congratulations, you know, on your anniversary, hello to all the fan members. That was pretty. That was pretty special to get that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that was uh, that was a real highlight. But you had said, uh, I don't know if I answered the question. I think I went on a bit of a tangent. <laughs> but, I also want, but I also can because you mentioned about Paul and Linda reading the magazine. We sent it to all of them. We sent to Yoko, we sent to George, we sent to Paul, and we also sent to Ringo. When Ringo did his auction a few years back and liquidated a lot of his collection, part of the one of the lots was his issues of Good Day Sunshine. <laughs> so, so he obviously right. got them and obviously kept them, and that was a surprise to us because we had no idea if these guys ever got the magazine. But we always liked saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we sent copies to all the guys, which we did. We just never knew until Paul, until Linda said what she did, until Ringo's uh, auction came, that they actually did get him and they had him in their possession. <laughs> it's interesting nice. that they that they do read them. You know, I mean, I've, I've I've heard about them. You know, reading reading Beetle fan as well. I mean, things get back <laughs> sure. sometimes, and yeah. Uh, yeah, it's why do you think why do you think the fanzine world has largely sort of shriveled up to a degree? I mean, there's Beatle fans still left, and um, I don't know, is Day Trippin' still around? No. It's, it's a website. It's a website. Yeah. And there's uh, news on there. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, Tom, uh, there's, there's Tom, Tom small Aguilar. Ones. There's still small ones. Tom does, yeah, Aguilar does uh, Octopus's Garden out of New England. Right. There's, mm-hmm. there's a handful. It's really fun uh, because back in the day i don't know if beetle fan did this but um we tried to be um like friends with everybody so beetles unlimited the tokyo beetles fan club the london one mm. you mentioned barb fan all the ones that had fanzines we would swap the minute one came out you know we would there would be an automatic subscription list and people would get everyone else's fanzine so it, there was never really competition which was really awesome everybody really had their own little niche, I guess, and everybody respected it. So if someone published a magazine that only put out, you know, five-page mimeographs once a year, 
they were still getting, you know, six issues of GDS and we were getting theirs. So that was a nice, it was a nice kind of a brotherhood or sisterhood out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, when, I think... uh, when, when Barb uh, uh, discontinued the right thing, uh, she gave Beetle Fan her uh, her subscription list and also she uh she did some uh, she was a, she contrib- contributed some articles for uh for a short while before she kind of moved away from the the beetle world mm-hmm. you were talking about why uh alan why uh the the fan scenes kind of dropped down i i i think it i the answer would be just like newspapers the internet you know yeah yeah and I, exactly. And I guess and I guess maybe, you know, I have to kind of take a little bit of the blame for that, you know, because I mean I you know It's all your I, fault, Steve. It's all my it's like, <laughs> Yeah, it's all your fault. You killed the fanzine. Well, I don't know if I killed them. I hope not. But I mean I th- I think, you know, when when I started and when the other websites got started, um, I think that, you know, I mean the internet was new and there was, you know, some things happening there and I think that probably had a little bit to do with it maybe I don't well you know it 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 may but still yeah. i think fanzines are a little different than newspapers um and right. that mm-hmm. the audience for fanzines is is passionate about what the fanzines are about and i mean i know it's still i, I can read all this stuff on the internet, but it's still kind of nice to get a copy of Beetle Fan in the mail, you know. Right, yeah. and the, the yeah. one thing—the one thing that Beetle Fan has always done, and the one thing that you know, the Good Day Sunshine did, and and some of the others is they went into a, a little more depth, I think, than a lot of the internet. I mean, there was some depth on some of the internet stories, but Beetle Fan was a lot deeper into, you know, into that. They, I, I guess, the word would be geeky. Kind of, but that that's kind of what they, I mean, that's kind of what they did. They got more scholarly, you know, um, you know, you had people like Alan, for example, writing for Beetle Fan uh, on a regular basis. You know, you had a lot of people, you know, you had, that's what you had, you know, and I, I think that's, there's the, there's the difference there. Hmm. So. Well, plus, I mean, we have, we have now a whole, basically a whole roster of, you know, very well known contributors people uh we were we inherited we inherited tom frangione from uh from charles uh we have bruce spicer we have jeff slate we have uh, uh we have kid o'toole uh who's been uh you know writing for uh, for beetle fan for going on a quarter of a century even though mm-hmm. she's one of the younger contributors uh, and uh, uh, and um, the, and uh, Wally, of course, uh, has been writing for Beetle Fan since uh, since nearly the beginning, uh, and uh, and so we have you know basically a real kind of murderer's row of of Beatles. I, I don't want to say scholars, but yeah, hardcore. Right. That's right. That's yeah, accurate. scholars. Is yeah, uh, yeah. I think scar- scholars is a good word. Sure. Okay. Like you not only had contributors, you had correspondents. You know, you had people right. that you could reach out to in different parts of the world if you wanted news of something that was reported in Japan. Uh, I think Bill had didn't he have his own yep. correspondent well, that, in yeah. Japan? Oh yes, and and, and Charles too. And, yeah, and that's no. how in fact, that's how I got started uh, with Beetle Fan because um, uh, in I guess maybe the third or fourth issue. Uh, Bill was asking for a New York correspondent, mm. and so I had become a subscriber, and uh, and so I, uh, I volunteered. And basically, and this is gives you an idea of how long ago 1979 was. Uh, basically, being the New York correspondent amounted to basically cutting clippings from the New York newspapers, <laughs> uh, putting them in a uh, putting them in a Manila, a Manila envelope. And sending them down to uh, Decatur, Georgia, where uh, uh, where Bill and, and Leslie uh, uh, published the uh, published the magazine, and um, and and in fact, uh, uh, I guess it was the the last issue of the first year, the New York Post headline: "The Beatles are back," which was this very <laughs> premature rumor about. Um, 
Uh, they, the, the Beatles had been asked by Kurt Waldheim, who was the Secretary General of the UN, to, uh, to reunite to, for a uh, concert for the boat people, if I recall, from Cambodia. Uh, I, think that, I, think that's I may, right, yeah. I may not have the may not have the details correct, but uh, but it was like a front page headline, and so I sent that down to Bill, and it ended up on the front page of uh, of the magazine. And of course, you know, the big test, of course, came in in December uh, of 1980. But again, that's but that's how. I got involved with the magazine, but yeah, uh, people like Peter Palmieri, who's been uh, uh, Beatle fans West Coast correspondent for years and years, and uh, we have a Japanese correspondent and a Latin American correspondent. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so yeah, absolutely. And Charles, Charles certainly had the same with uh, with the, with Good Day Sunshine. Did you yeah, use we- email in those early days, Al? Or I'm sorry? was it? Did you use email, or was it, or did you no, have to we send? Didn't, no, we didn't start doing email. Uh, you know, I didn't start like emailing articles until probably maybe the nineties, maybe the late nineties. More likely, though, probably the early early two thousands. Oh, uh, I would think it, that, I, would, it was, I would I would think it'd be earlier than that. I mean, no, what, well, Bill Bill is uh, Bill's old school. Okay, and so it took him a while to kind of uh, uh, get him into the uh, you know the technology. So it was probably so we probably didn't begin emailing articles until, like I said, probably probably within the within the last twenty years. Did you do That's snail probably. mail? Snail mail before that? Oh yeah, the, oh yeah, mm. everything had been snail mail wow. before that. Okay, okay, uh, Ken. Well, uh, I have a question, but first I just want to make a comment, and that is that when I first started out in radio doing Beatle shows, first on college radio, and then during my 10 years on WDHA, as Al well remembers, a big part of my show, a big part of my show was having news every single week. Yeah. And um, and I, I looked for Beatle Fan and Good Day Sunshine and Beatles Monthly Magazine. And all the other smaller magazines, I don't think we mentioned Instant Karma, which was basically a, you know, a John and Yoko fanzine. Mm-hmm. But they also included news on the other Beatles, too. Yeah. Um, there was one called Fab that Don Jeffers, who lived in the, the New York area, started. That was mm-hmm. a very small fanzine. But I collected all these fanzines uh, in part because I was hungry for news every single week. And Beatles Monthly lasted a month and i needed to stretch the news out (laughs) so um all these other fanzines were such a tremendous help and you never you never knew how in one fanzine there might be some piece of information that was in there that wasn't in the other fanzines so um and when you said charles what you did about all the work that you were doing that it really was a labor of love neither you nor bill king or any of these other the smaller fanzines ever made a living from this. And, uh, you know, this was all what, what you could do in your spare time. And you all deserve to be so commended for it because, like we said, this is all pre-internet. You had to do it the old-fashioned way. And gathering all this information was just so extraordinary. It's so much work to do, and I think most people aren't aware of all the work that was put into it. But um, when I when I look back at, at Good Day Sunshine as well as Beatle Fan continuing now, you had not only the news, but you also had reviews of the newest releases. You had historical perspectives. You look back at certain anniversaries. Um, you also had personal stories, personal contact with the Beatles, which you had quite a lot of, Charles, in Good Day Sunshine. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Also, and also a lot of um, you know things for the collector. Which may be, you know, very much on the geeky side for a lot of people, but um, like we mentioned, Matt Hurwitz, he was always good at coming up with all these different versions of different Beatle albums from around the world with different serial numbers and what was inscribed on the albums and so many variances. And I'm, you know, wondering between Beatle Fan and Good Day Sunshine, did you think about who your audience would be? Was there anything that was off the table that you wouldn't consider at all? Or was anything up for grabs? Um, So with Good Day Sunshine, I wanted to be, you know, what would appeal to me. I wanted it to, you know, give a lot of news, 
a lot of reviews, a, a lot of things that you couldn't read anywhere, but with a personality, with a laugh, with a smile. And, um, you know, I, 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 I don't know if anything was off the table, but I do remember Alan Williams getting mad at me because I reported that he uh, got drunk and was arrested. And, and, and I can't remember if what I call them the, 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 the something that gave the Beatles away. You know, how, how, how could he manage when he can't manage his own life? And he really came down on me for that, you know, because I just never thought he'd get it. But he did. And I, that, that's about the only, I think, thing I shouldn't have done in all those years. And I felt really bad because we were friends and we were friends even up until he passed. But it hurt his feelings. And I, I was, that's the only thing I look back on if I could have retracted that and perhaps letting Matt Hurwitz take over. Aside from those two things, I guess uh, <laughs> I don't have very many regrets and there wasn't a lot that was, uh, you know, off the table. I was kidding about Matt Hurwitz. If he's listening, Matt, you did amazing things with the magazine. I wish you could have sustained it because that was at a point where uh, my parents were getting on in age and I was starting to have too many. Th- I could never have kept GDS at that level for much longer. Yeah, it is really a shame. As, as Alan was saying, it's nice to have a hard copy have everything right in front of you that you could hold instead of always reading something off the computer or off your 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 cell phone mm-hmm. yeah. so um um al how about you well i don't i don't i think the only I, I don't think there was anything that was you know that was off the table although what we did do in the uh in the early in the early years we did a fair amount of um you know encounter type pieces you know of people who you know how uh, you know people who had met a beetle right or met the the uh, the whole group and we kind of uh de-emphasized those those pieces fairly early on and uh, and especially since we uh we knew that charles was doing a lot of that sort of thing because so we we kind of figured that that you know that that Charles would do a better job with that kind of uh, that kind of material, and and the other the other thing was that what I think set Beatle Fan apart from really all of the other Beatles publications was the fact that we were uh, that that we were objective. Uh, that we uh, that we were you know we tried to be as even handed as possible, and so we basically told it the way it was you know, well if we if we didn't like a particular album we said so uh and we you know we try especially since the not so much good day sunshine but the uh and and not even not even good uh strawberry fields forever but the some of the the other beatles fanzines had been so so completely one-sided you know basically putting them up on on a pedestal and they could do nothing wrong and uh we you know we basically took the attitude that they were you know yes you know yes they're the beatles but also they were human beings and uh and especially with their with their solo work they might not uh might not have uh put out the greatest of material in certain cases. <laughs> so we tried to be more objective than, than, you know, the, the, the earlier fanzines. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. I guess I, I had, um, yeah, I agree with what Al's saying, where, where it was, you know, they reported news, news, news. And, and I think GDS was going towards more of a, you know, encounters and yeah. also, we had a really good pipeline to Liverpool because I was going mm-hmm. to England so often that we got a lot of stuff from Bill Harry and I got a lot of stuff, you know, from that end of the world, which I, right. not that it was an exclusive, but it was more, it was maybe more personal. And because um, if in fact, Beatle fan intentionally backed off on doing that because Good Day Sunshine was, um, you know, more that way. Well, then I can officially announce that because Beetle fan was doing such a good job with the news. I was making up half the stuff, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I was just making up things. <laughs> Anything for a scoop. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I, I think the fact that um, you know Beetle fan took the view that uh, you know we don't have to 
simply as a matter of course praise everything that they do and everything that comes out. Um, I, I mm-hmm. think really made a difference for me as a reader, first of all, but also as a, a contributor, you know, because it seemed like a real magazine rather than a propaganda tool, an unpaid propaganda tool of Apple, you know. It, it definitely wasn't that, you know. So I, I think that was a that was a good thing. I mean, as some of the others did too occasionally. Um, I, I seem to remember... Barb Fennick being fairly critical of Apple yeah. at the time mm-hmm. they were suing, suing yes. um, Beatlemania show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and, and some other things, too. So, yeah. I and think I it's... remember even during the, the 76 tour, I recall she was kind of somewhat critical of, the, uh, of the, the McCartney organization, especially the security people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, and, that, but, but, but mm-hmm. that was a difficult decision to try and be objective because a lot of fans, even now, I know we've, uh, you know, there's been issues on this show where we've been critical and, and we've heard from fans who, you know, who don't appreciate that. And I would suspect that back then it was probably worse. Because, oh, believe me. Um, hmm. One of the first pieces that I did. Mm hmm. Beetle fan was a was a report card. And Charles knows <laughs> was a report card on the, um, the 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 first decade of the solo careers, and I went at it from an objective point of view. So I gave uh, well, particularly I gave um, uh, kind of ironically I gave John a an incomplete, and this is in the spring of 1980. So. You know, that's kind of kind of prophetic. But but yeah. I also gave George, uh, I think, a C and overall. And you should have seen the mail. <laughs> oh, my mm. goodness. It was it was as if it was as if I had committed heresy. In fact, there was there was one person, especially after I later gave George's Somewhere in England album a bad review Somebody wrote in saying that I was that I had a vendetta going against George Harrison mm. because because I was you know I was I basically was calling it the way I saw it maybe you know maybe I was right maybe I was maybe I wasn't right but that was the way I saw it and yeah so at the, at that time people were not used to that kind of sort of objective. Um, reporting, commentary, whatever, however you want to put it. Well, no matter what, you still have to realize that whatever it is you're expressing is still an opinion. Of course. Okay. And the fans oh, yeah. should look at it that way, too. Right. Uh, no, nobody, what they're saying, nothing is the Bible, how we must all look at this music. So. Right. But especially up to that time... Most of the, you know, most of the, of the, you know, the fanzines had been, for the most part, uh, pretty uncritical, you know. Yeah, that's uh, true. Really, that's true. Y- yeah. Yeah. Early on, we certainly were, you know, we were certainly there for the, um, you know, the, we, not 16 magazine, but we were certainly there for the people who loved and, and thought, you know, the guys could do no wrong. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. In fact, I, 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 I can remember... Uh, when we used to do a table at at Beetlefest, and people would ask about, you know, about comparing Beetlefan and Good Day Sunshine, and I used to say that that Beetlefan was really more like Time or Newsweek, whereas Good Day Sunshine was more like, and and this is not by any disrespect, but that it was more like People Magazine. That's 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 fair, you know. I I would yeah. say, I would say that's funny because I would say Beetle fan was the New York Times, and that okay. I was the New York Post. I would say that. Yeah. <laughs> say okay. that too. Yeah. Hmm. Except except for your grading column because I used to love when the New York Post used to do the grading of the Mets and the Yankees. You know, before the yeah. season, after the season. So whenever I yeah. saw your column on that, Al, I used to you know love it for, for, because it reminded me of that. <laughs> yeah. But both fanzines did extraordinary work in their own way. 
I mean, there's so much work that was done in both fanzines that, you know, how can you not admire the work of both those fanzines, you know? Sure, sure. Well, I think someone coming up to a Beatle fan table is, is you know, is going to say, what's the difference between you and Good Day Sunshine? Expecting to praise Beatle fan, just as if, at my convention, if I, if I had a Good Day Sunshine table, people would come up and, you know, praise Good Day Sunshine and say, yeah, yeah, we don't get a Beatle fan. It's too, you know, mm-hmm. it's too uh, mm. starchy or too, you know, uh, too upper stiff, you know, but Good Day Sunshine. Yeah, you're going to hear that forever. I think the difference. Sure. The, the differences complemented each other, and if somebody was subscribing to one, the likelihood is they were getting the other, and if they were getting both, they were really, you know, they were getting well-rounded Beatle news. Yeah. Try to time it so that we were in the alternate months. I don't know if you ever knew that, Al. We tried to time it so our magazine came out um, whatever month Beatle fan didn't. So if Beatle fan... Um, hosted, no, yeah. I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> we would we didn't we didn't want someone getting the same magazine on both magazines on the same day. They give them give them time to read one and then jump on the other. Has there been any thought um, of uh, making an electronic archive of either magazine? Because it would be really nice to have all that material in searchable form. You know. Well, you can you can do it. I have all the issues if you want to do that. Sure. If I want to scan them myself, is a <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of work. Oh yeah, and yeah. And really Bill has has talked about it from time to time, but it's uh, it's it's an awful lot of work. Or even bound hmm. volumes. How about that? Since the Beatle fan had the you know first two volumes, um, and then Perian or Co- Pop Culture Inc. went out of business, but um, right, you know, it would be nice to have bound volumes of both of those. I, I I don't know what the market would be for them, but I think they'd be really, really nice to mm-hmm. have, you know, in 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 that form, maybe with an index. <laughs> More work. Uh, I, I don't yeah. know. I, I have I have a complete run of Beatle fan from issue number one, and I have a complete run of GDS from number one. If anyone wants it, I'm I'm taking offers. No problem. <laughs> have the exclusive complete run, complete set, no problem. <laughs> there must be someone out there who has plenty of time on their hands and is dying to accomplish this. And we'll have them on the show as a guest if they do. <laughs> <laughs> That'll entice them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm. Charles, how many issues of GDS did you do? Oh, my gosh. I don't know. That's a great yeah. question. Um, <laughs> well over, I don't know, a hundred and something? hundred and something. Okay. <laughs> and how many issues has, uh, has Bill put out, uh, Al? Uh, well over 200. Uh, the new issue is actually across the room, so I can't really it's, get it uh, right now. I have it here. It, it, it's 229. Okay. 229. Okay. Okay. I mean, that's a, yeah. I mean, even, you know, I was just thinking just highlights, put out a highlights book. Um, kind of like what the Beatles book did um, a couple of years ago, you know. That would be even that still. Would, that's still a lot of work because you still well, got to oh, go yeah. through every single issue. Oh, absolutely. I yeah. mean, yeah. Anytime you do that kind of thing, sure, there's a lot of work to be done. But there's a there's a there's a thought. Um, what was the most memorable issue? Was the was the you guys uh, Charles? You mentioned the Lennon issue, uh, the Lennon death issue. Was that? the most memorable for you? No, I would like to forget that, actually. Let's make that mm. the least memorable. Okay. Probably, probably the anniversary edition that Paul contributed to, and we got all those, you know, Cynthia and so many great people, you know, con- contributed audio to that. That's probably the most memorable. So many issues also, I forgot, doubled as program magazines. If I would have a major convention, we'd print up an oh, extra, yeah. we'd print, we'd okay. print up an extra 5,000 of them. And give them out as the convention program. So, there's so many great issues. And, and, and you know, when you hit upon doing a, a volume of getting like the greatest hits of the magazine and putting it out as a book, it, it's a sore point for me because at one point I gave a batch of articles and original photos and and my actual original layouts to a gentleman. And we'll tell you, his name was Ed Gross, and he and he put out a book mm-hmm. or two. And he said he was going to put out an issue with GDS, uh, a magazine, uh, a book rather, a book, you know, the greatest um, highlights of. And I never got the materials back. He never published it. It was one of those 
really you're talking about 20 years ago but it was a it left a really wow. bad taste in my mouth and when people always okay. said you never published a book and never wrote about your experiences meeting Beatles or doing the conventions or anything like that it's really that's the reason it, that left such a bad taste in my mouth unfortunately sure. and if you publish a, a, a fanzine of over 100 pages for that many years you think you, you know I've, I, I published 100 books I don't need to do another one <laughs> yeah <laughs> Mm. Al, uh, what's the what's the issue that you remember? I remember. I seem to remember when Bill was on with us, way back when, mm -hmm. he mentioned the um, the reunion when he when he got the the scoop on the on the Beatles session on the uh, Fab sessions on the yeah. uh, Beatles sessions. In, in That's fact, that that actually didn't even appear, uh, at least at first. It didn't appear in the magazine, but it appeared in I think the very first. Beetle Fan Extra, mm -hmm. which is the you know the one page, um, you know sort of uh, news breaking news if you want to call it that, uh, uh, edition that we put out usually between each issue, and uh, and that the story the the the, the story of the um, the the tape that um, that Yoko had uh, had given Paul right. uh, at the um, uh, the the Hall of Fame induction at John's Hall of Fame induction, uh, that was uh, that story and the and the beginning of the the Threedles sessions. That was like the um, uh, the big scoop, mm -hmm. and the um, also the the issues uh, around the time of the anthology, in the mid uh, right in the you know in ninety five and ninety six, those were a lot of fun to do because there was so much. There was so much to cover, and it was, you know, plus it was a, you know, if for it was it was really like a uh, kind of a, almost like a revival of of Beatle fandom at that point, mm -hmm. um, but also obviously the you know the the first big test was obviously the the Lennon commemorative, which was what was supposed to be the second anniversary issue of the magazine. Right. And then basically had to be done over, you know, really from scratch in basically two weeks. And then also the uh, the, the 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 George Harrison commemorative issue that we did in the fall of uh, in the fall of 2001, uh, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, we had a little bit more, you know, lead time, if you want to put it that way, uh, on doing that. But I thought it I, I thought we did a you know, a really nice, nice job with that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but there have been, uh, I mean, there have been a lot of, a lot of highlights. I mean, Alan may have, uh, uh, may have some other ones of his, um, you know, from in his memory bank. Let me just interject that um, we, like I, I mentioned, we did uh, have Bill King uh, back when we were doing phone calls um, instead of using Skype like we are now. Um, mm -hmm. It was back, uh, things we said today, number 26, when it was just Ken and I. And uh, it's it's online. It's on uh, the Podbean uh, site, Beatle exam, beatlesexaminer.podbean.com. And just search for Bill King, but it's number tw it's show number 26, if you mm -hmm. uh, if you want to listen to it. Alan, did you want to... Did, did you want to say anything about it? About it? Uh, yeah, what, issue there? yeah. Why don't I just say a, a couple, just because Al had mentioned that, and it, it would be odd not to have a response. You know? um, yeah, yeah. Uh, there were two things. Um, probably the first time I interviewed McCartney in 1990, um, that was an interview that had a lot of stuff that just was not going to get into the New York Times about. Um, you know, his policy now about uh, releasing multiple versions of singles, all with different B-sides and, and things like that. And um, I thought he was very sort of frank um, in, in ways that I, I actually wasn't really prepared for because you usually read the same answers, um, but I tried right. not, not to ask the, the same questions um, to avoid that, and, and I think it worked. But I think the best thing that I did for Bill um, probably was around the time of the Beatles anthology because mm -hmm. I went to London to do a piece for the Times and interviewed Neil and interview I'd interviewed Paul and Ringo. George didn't want to talk about it. And 
you know, just and Derek and a whole bunch of people and Mark Lewison about, you know, who who told me about finding these, uh, you know, George Martin finding these acetates in cupboards and the two of them sort of trying to figure out what what they actually were, you know, because it, it wasn't mm-hmm. clear when you just find an undated acetate, you know. And, what were they? Well, you know, the uh, first, the Pete Best version of Love Me Do, and because mm-hmm. it didn't even say okay. Pete Best on it. I mean, it, you know, when George Martin brought it to Mark, he, he wasn't entirely sure what it was and who it was. And, you know, through deduction and listening to the drumming and various things, they they pieced it together the same with the anti white, please, please me. Um, ah, okay. So things like that. And I interviewed George Martin for that and Jeff Emmerich and, um, and I sent the QAs of all of those straight to bill. And so I thought that, mm-hmm. you know, gave bill plenty to work with for the anthology that, um, yeah, I doubt another Beatles fan magazine would have had. Okay. That's amazing that you got to interview all those people all at once. Yeah. It, it was a yeah. fun trip. <laughs> I bet I bet it was. Did you hit any did you hit any record stores while you were there? Uh, probably, but yeah. Probably. I, I don't I don't remember. Um I mean I do remember even though George didn't want to talk, going I went to a meeting where they were basically storyboarding the uh, Free as a Bird promo. And George was in that meeting, so we you know, just sort of said hello. That was it. It wasn't an interview, but um, but even that was, it was you know, it was, it was just fun. It was a great trip. And now that brings up, uh, they were storyboarding the Free as a Bird video? Yeah, um, they were explaining what they were going to do, and they had that Steve Wright book of, you know, all, all the songs and what they were about, and because they were... Oh, my. Yeah, and so they were just putting together what they were going to do, and uh, it was it was great to hear about that in advance. I mean, they weren't really showing anything, and definitely not playing the song with me in the room. For some reason, I could not hmm. persuade them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have wow. to wait like everybody else. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, uh, I mean, they, they didn't start uh, actually saying the images that we're going to use. They were just talking about the concepts. Is that, is that right? Right, right. Okay. And if that's they played me the track, I would have had to call Bill and sing it to him. And so for, yeah. for Bill's sake, it's yeah. good. Because there were, you know, there were times when I would get an early promo of something like I, I can remember, for instance, My Brave Face and Flying to My Home. Mm-hmm. And I remember calling Bill and playing it to him over the phone. And we uh, have subsequently referred to that as the the phone mix, you know. But, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Wow. You know, sorry, Bill, that I was such a jerk at the very start, but uh, you know, we've had a great time since then. <laughs> and I remember, I, I remember one uh, um, thing involving you, Alan, when we were on. I guess it was when we were still on Prodigy or the Prodigy Group, mm. when you revealed to us the um, the uh, name of Paul's new album was going to be Flaming Pie. Mm. Remember that? I don't remember <laughs> it. No. I, I do, because uh, you told us that before anybody else knew it. You said that's that's the uh, the name of the album, and yeah. it turned out it was. So that. anyway, I think we've about uh, run out of time, and God, this went by so quickly. I wish we could do two hours. We could, probably could have filled it easily. Um, could I? Can I have thirty seconds? You can have you can have thirty seconds, Charles. Go. So we started by, you know, tipping our hat to Joe Pope, who was, you know, a pioneer in not only the fanzine, but also, you know, the first one to do Beatle conventions, of course, in mm-hmm. Boston. We also want to, you know, remember Joel Glazer, who uh, yes. passed away not too long ago. And Joel not only contributed a first to Strawberry Fields, but then to Good Day Sunshine. But yeah. he's the one who put together an entire issue on Paul, you know, the Paul is Dead, Death Rumors and, and Death Clues which was the Bible forever for, for all the clues. And, and it was a basis of his own pr- presentation. And, you know, Joel was such a, such a great uh, fanzine guy and such a perfect editor and someone who s- contributed all the time. And he, 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 the people losing people like him and the people who we've lost through the years, uh, you know, just makes the whole fan, it's just it's bittersweet in so many ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In any event, thank you both, Al and Charles. Thank you, guys. 
immensely for being here and talking about this. This is this has been great. This has really this really fun. been fun. This has really been fun. And Al, you are welcome back here anytime, sir. So I'll come crawling back. When I... <laughs> but no, this was a blast. On occasion, this was a blast and, to and have you guys. You guys know that I'm that I'm listening every week. Oh yes, we've heard. We've we've yeah. heard. We've heard. <laughs> but uh, again, and Ken, can you believe Charles went to a, through a whole show without plugging his Beatle tours to Liverpool or any yeah. of my events? Yeah. When, when do they happen, Charles? Yeah, when. when they happen to happen every August, and we've been doing them since 1983. So if anyone wants to come on the Ultimate Beatles Tour to London or Liverpool, just visit uh, liverpooltours.com. And, uh, and we're also doing a Beatles festival, a music festival. It's called the Fab Four Music Festival in Connecticut, June 9th. So plenty of time for that. But, um, but and, and I think I'm one of the MCs. Yeah, but we don't want to plug anything, so I appreciate it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so, right. so, that's just make right. sure, just make sure you don't plug uh, the trip to Las Vegas to see Love in February. Exactly, we'll save that for next year. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, let me let me first um, turn it to uh, Charles and Al, um, where people can get a hold of both of you. Charles, you first. Where can people get a hold of you? Liverpool Tours at AOL dot com, and the website is Liverpool Tours dot com. And they could call me, 203-795-4737, anytime, day or night. Do you actually, do you answer the phone? Sure, of course. Oh, okay. You get to talk to Charles in person. How about that? <laughs> and he's uh, up at all hours of the night, too. Yes, yeah, call him, call him <laughs> in the middle of the night. I'm <laughs> sure he'll, he'll love that. Hmm. Um, Al, uh, where can people get a hold of you? Uh, the easiest is um, uh, Facebook, Al Sussman, uh, Twitter, at ASUSS49, or through Beetlefan uh, Magazine, uh, uh, www.beetlefan.com, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, the uh, Change in Times, 101 Days that Shaped a Generation is oh, still yes. out there. Thank you. And- Thank you for mentioning that. Thank you. Okay, um, and let's uh, go start with Ken. Ken, where can people get a hold of you? You can email me at everylittlething at att.net. My website's kenmichaelsradio.com. I should mention that in addition to my weekly Beatles trivia, which starts every Monday and goes through Sunday, um, I do have a special contest right now for a non beatle prize, which happens once in a while. And that's a DVD of a concert that the Bee Gees gave in Melbourne, Australia in 1989. It's a brand new release. It's coming out February the 2nd. It's called the Bee Gees One for All Tour. If you want to win that, just go to my website and all the details will be there at kenmichaelsradio.com. There you go. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Alan, uh, where can people get a hold of you? Yeah, the easiest way to get me is through Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And we all read the emails that you send to the show address, which is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And you can get a hold of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I have. A personal Facebook page that uh, is music, pl- a bunch, and other things. But uh, I have a Beatle page called Beatle News and Information. The show has a Facebook page called Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. There's also a second Things We Said Today page for the Fab Four Radio uh, broadcast. And you can download the show on beatlesexaminer.podbean.com uh, it's on iTunes, it's on YouTube it's on TuneIn Radio it's everywhere you, you want to be um, so it's all over the place and it, anywhere it seems like anywhere you can pick up podcasts we are listed so we hope you will listen to the past shows and the current ones that's about all we have time for today, thanks to Charles Rosene and Al Sussman On behalf of Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen, this is Steve Marinucci saying thank you for listening and tune in to us next time. Bye.